Welcome, and thank you for coming. Anybody who has read Ariana Harbuck's work knows that tonight we are in for a treat. If you have not read it, then you will want to after this. <laughs> <laughs> or oh, well, yes. Uh, so, I'll, I'll mention it now. If you haven't read it, then we have Die My Love and Feeble Minded both for sale here. Thanks to Charlie Yay! and Charco to be able to sell. And we have a selection of other Charco books as well. Yay! <laughs> Don't give a Scottish person alcohol. I'm sorry. <laughs> there were nibbles, you could have had your little garlic. I did have some pretzels. <laughs> I agree. I'll begin, I will introduce our speakers. Then we've got a video from Carolina, who I'll introduce shortly. We'll go into one reading. We've got a conversation about aspects of the work, the translation, a second reading, a bit more conversation from us, and then plenty of time for you to ask questions. We're starting about quarter an hour late, so we'll finish about 8.15 as well, just to let you know, I know that some people do have to nip off. So, Ariana Harvix was born in Buenos Aires, studied in Paris. Um, I have here a highly acclaimed figure in contemporary Argentinian literature. Um, just a few days ago, she was one of the reference points in an article in Ais, the Spanish newspaper, about making the Latin American boom include more female authors. Exactly what we have been talking about over the past few days. She is part of this movement in Spanish. Her debut novel, Die My Love, Mata de Amor, pulses with brutal energy. In the English translation by Carolina Orloff and Sarah Moses, and edited by Annie McDermott was long-listed for the 2018 Man Booker International Prize and shortlisted for the Republic of Consciousness Prize in the same year. A follow-up novel, Feeble Minded, La Débil Mental, which on its Spanish language release was described by Ais as intensely poetic, was published by Charco in May 2019. I'm also lucky enough to have read the third part of what Ariana calls an involuntary trilogy in Spanish, Precoz, which is precocious, and also her latest novel, Degenerado Degenerate, that was published this year by Anagrama in Spain. You don't need to know what I think about it, I can tell you what the critics think about it. <laughs> Joanna Walsh, a kick up the arse of a literary novel. <laughs> People minded disassembles form. Sense of it. I take it you can hear me at the back. Yeah. <laughs> I put the microphone down there. Sensibility, everything. At once a riot, a revolution, and a head trick. We also have reading Ariana Harbit as a raw, unforgiving, deeply unsettling experience. Having reread the two English translations and the two Spanish books recently, it is intense, I promise you. Her ferocious yet surgically precise sentences cut to the deepest strata of the subconscious. Ariana Harvitz is the real deal, and the very definition of an artist, that's Adam Biles, author of Feeding Time. Lina Meruane, author of Seeing Red. The acoustic quality of her prose, the pulse of her voice, the intensity of her imagery make her subject so daring, so relentless, so damned and unconventional, very hard to drop or ever to forget. One last one, Isaac Rosa in El País. Harvick achieves an asphyxiating writing, saturated with images of great beauty, despite their disturbing character. We're going to touch on elements from that in our conversation. We also have, to Ariana's left, Annie McDermott, translates fiction and poetry from Spanish and Portuguese. Her works appeared in publications including Granta, World Literature Today, Two Lines, Asinto, Alba, Dolky Archive Press, most recently, and I've left it in my bag, may I please get a video? <laughs> no, we need to show this off too. Loop by Brenda Rothano, we have here. Woo. I better not leave it there, Charles <laughs> will sell it. In 2013, she was the runner-up in the Harvard Seca Young Translators Prize, and in 2014, she took part in a six-month mentorship with the translator Margaret Del Costa, Whoa. during which she worked on texts by Brazilian writers. She has previously lived in I was listing things yesterday, this is a fantastic <laughs> list. Mexico City, Sao Paulo, she's also spent time in Tbilisi, Georgia, studying Georgian, and in Montevideo, Uruguay. <laughs> Annie also has various years of experience as an editor, something that we'll talk about and touch on here. <coughs> we also have, unfortunately by video, we were so hopeful she could come, but unfortunately, owing to a, a scheduling conflict, she can't make it, but she has recorded a video for us. Carolina Orloff, the director and editor of Charco Press. 
Um, she introduces herself, so I won't do that. It's a six minute video. After that, we'll lead in to a reading from Mariana and from Annie. Hello there, everybody there. <laughs> My name is Carolina Love, and I'm the main um, editor at Chaco Press, and I'm recording this video because I'm not there, obviously, and I'm really sorry that I can't be. Um, I have no doubt that it's, it's, it's a wonderful conference, and I'm really sorry to be missing it. Uh, I'll keep this brief because it's... Um, it's not very interesting to look at my face, um, <laughs> but um, I just wanted to say very briefly that uh, as a publisher, um, and as a publisher of Latin American literature that um, tries to break away from mainstream and, um, and, and tries to broaden the array of what's out there, uh, I was very interested in, in Ariana's literature from from the very beginning. Um, her um, aesthetic proposition, her aesthetic project, um, I think steps away from everything else I, I've read. Um, I think she, well to me, she, she spoke from a different place and about um, very universal things that I felt were very necessary to put out there um, for the English-speaking reader. Um, so, um, as a publisher, I was very interested to try and provide um, the readership with with what Ariana has to offer, which, if you haven't read her yet, I urge you to do so. Um, her point of view, um, her poetry, her way of approaching, as I said, universal topics such as motherhood, desire, um, womanhood, um, family mandates, morality, you name it. Um, it's very unique in my point of view and, and almost a temporal. Um, and I think that's what I like about her writing in that sense, that it's not slapping you in the face in, in a, you could say, you know, in a 21st century way, um, or um, in, 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 you know, in a Virginia Woolf way, it just, it just um, cr creates almost a different language. And, and in that sense, um, related um, to the idea of translation and translating her, that um, that style in itself, which refers to a particular language, a particular use of imagery, of um, uh, synecdokes, uh, of music, uh, of course, um, imposed a um, challenge to the translators. And, um, and Annie is there, and um, oh, here, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> specific examples of translating or co-translating uh, Feeble Minded, which we did together, and that's Ariana's uh, second novel in what she calls, and you can ask her, um, an involuntary trilogy that starts with Time I Love, uh, continues with Feeble Minded, and then concludes with, um, with Precoce, um, meaning literally precocious, uh, in English, which Chaco Press is also going to publish um, in 2021, and for which we don't have a title yet, do we, Annie? Um, <laughs> Annie as well. So, um, but yeah, so Annie can tell you, I'm sure you, you can ask her about very specific uh, hurdles or, um, uh, yeah, I mean, all of it is a challenge, a translating is a challenge, but a specific. Um, needling points that, that we had to go over and over again. Uh, in general, I can tell you, uh, I'm not as a publisher now, but as a translator, that um, um, for, for both Time I Love and for Feeble Minded, what I thought was the most um, difficult and challenging, um, again, sorry to be repeating myself, but it was the idea, the idea of the poetry on one hand, which is in, in, intrinsically linked to the music, that was going to be my second thing. So the, the, the music of Ariana's um, 
prose um, is completely linked to the poetry um, and, and those two are kind of the, they, they kind of uh, intertwined to make um, the spinal cord of her style, I think. Uh, so it's not so much about the tone or a silence or um, a, a specific uh, use of jargon, if you want. Uh, to me, it was it was trying to apprehend to apprehend the um, that, that musicality, that rhythm um, that that speaks from a poetry from from a poetry um, that was the, the the hardest. But once you hear it. Um, you know, you can't let it go. You have to try and reproduce it, and that's where I think um, <laughs> co-translation has worked very well um, to tr to translate or to render Ariana's style. Uh, and uh, and Annie, maybe you can uh, talk about that. You know, the difference of Fournier alone alone translating um, and also um, and and fabricating um, that language for that author in your head and it's just yourself. Um, vis a vis working with someone else and um, you know thinking together to try and uh, create you know you're creating create this new version of this music you're hearing uh, so I think I think God translation is definitely the way forward for Ariana's style anyway enjoy the conference uh, and um, and I look forward to hearing all about it when when it finishes. Thanks very much. Thanks. Can we leave that on? <laughs> <laughs> this is the uncomfortable moment. Do we have the publisher's presence or not? The declining. Best move today. Okay. So. I think we can go to the reading now to start your bilingual experience for tonight. Um, we're starting with the section in the original of page 76, page 97. <coughs> 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 No sé si voy a lograrlo. Lo real de la pasión, hija mía, es su imposibilidad. Ay, no, ya sé, mamá, todo eso. Shhh. Digo que si fuera posible, no sería posible. Eso es algo que aprendí el día que subiendo al capot con una mochilita en la espalda, le dije a mi rubio alto, me voy con vos. Soy tu posesión, quiero morir en tus brazos. Y nunca más lo volví a ver. O sea, quiero decir que es posible porque es imposible, pero ya lo sé, shh. sabiendo esto de memoria, que es el sufrimiento de la imposibilidad de una pasión, lo que la vuelve pasional, seguimos luchando por volverla posible, ¿por qué mierda? Ahora sí, te dejo hablar, shh. porque así somos las mujeres, seres endemoniados y testarudos, así somos de huecas, no queremos sufrir, Odiamos sufrir, tenemos terror al corazón latiendo en todo el cuerpo y el asma cuando nos anuncia que ya no está enamorado, que no se acostumbra a nuestro olor o cualquiera de esas estupideces, pero si no sufrimos, no hay pasión. Sufriendo, volvemos posible lo imposible, la pasión misma. En los pocos momentos en que el sufrimiento, el, el temor a perderlo, a que sea de otra, desaparece, esto lo sé bien porque hubo días, escucha bien, hubo días, los únicos en toda mi imbécil vida, en que el rubio me traía regalos fabricados por él. Cajitas de fósforos, gusanos pintados, ramas con formas. En esos días me besaba pesadamente y parecía que su lengua fangosa se quedaría pegada en mí hasta gastarme. Entonces, esos días no sufrí para nada. Tardes enteras sin sufrir al borde del lago, pero tampoco gocé. Enamorarse es la gran condenación. Enamorarse es el diluvio como un refugio electrificado. No sé si me entendés. No sé si estoy siendo clara. Ahora ya tenés edad. Yo siempre me decía, espera que deje los pañales, espera que hable de corrido, espera que menstrue. A su primera vez para decírselo y nunca pude. Enamorarse es ponerse delante de la cobra de dos metros. 
No pude instruirte a tiempo, te pido mil perdones. Me enseñaste, mamá, fallé en todo. Empecé tu infancia al revés. Debería haberte educado correctamente, no dejarte meter la mano en el caparazón y arrancarte la babosa. Pero no, si con verte me bastaba para entender. La escucho tumbada sobre el musgo. Una fina capa vegetal me cubre como arenilla. Estoy echada como un mamífero, con las orejas lanudas sobre los ojos. Estoy tapizada, forrada, y entre nosotras corre un acantilado y el agua trepa y resbala. This way, yes. The truth of passion, door to dear. The truth of passion, door to dear, is its impossibility. Oh God, Mum, please! I've heard it all before. Shh. What I'm saying is, if it were possible, it wouldn't be possible. Something I learned the day I climbed onto the bonnet with a little rucksack on my back, and I said to my tall blonde man, "I'm coming with you. I'm your property now. I want to die in your arms." And that was the last I saw of him. So what I mean is, it's possible because it's impossible. Yes, yes, I know. Shh. Even knowing it off by heart, that the suffering caused by the impossibility of passion is what makes it so passionate. Still, we fight to make it possible. Why the fuck is that? Now I'll let you speak. Shh. Because that's what women are like. We're wicked, pig-headed creatures. We have feathers for brains. We don't want to suffer. We hate to suffer. We're terrified of our heart beating in every part of our body as we gasp for air, and he tells us he's no longer in love with us, that he can't get used to our smell, some bullshit like that. And yet, if we don't suffer, there's no passion. Suffering is how we make possible the impossible. It's passion itself. In those few moments when the suffering, the dread of losing him, of there being another woman, disappears, and I know this very well because there were days. Listen carefully now. There were days, the only days in my whole dumb life, when that blonde guy would bring me gifts made with his own hands, matchboxes, painted worms, weirdly shaped twigs. On those days, he kissed me deeply, and it seemed his slimy tongue would stick to me and lick me down to nothing. So on those days, you see, I didn't suffer at all. Whole afternoons by the lake, free of suffering, but I wasn't happy either. Falling in love is the ultimate curse. Falling in love is the downpour under an electrified roof. I don't know if you follow. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Now you're old enough. I always used to say, "Wait till she's out of nappies. Wait till she can string a sentence together. Wait till her first period. Wait till her first time before you break it to her." But in the end, I never did. Falling in love is confronting the six-foot cobra. I couldn't teach you in time. I'm so sorry. You did teach me, Mum. I failed at everything. I started your childhood back to front. I should have given you a proper education, stopped you from sticking your fingers into your shell and pulling out the slug. No, Mum, you're wrong. Seeing you was enough. I hear her voice as I lie on the moss, a thin green layer covering me like fine sand. I'm lying down like a mammal, woolly ears over my eyes. I'm upholstered, lined, and between my mother and me runs a cliff edge, the water rising and rising. Thank you both. <laughs> we, just from that short reading, we can tell this, it's not an easy read. This is not a comfortable read or a comforting read. We've heard a multiplicity of voices, of registers, of references, and this carries through your work, Adiana. Could you talk to us a bit about how you use language in your work? Bueno, good evening, buenas noches. No, querría decirles que eh, soy atea, totalmente atea, pero creo en el traductor, ¿no? De verdad, eh, siempre, no, siempre tengo como tres, algo que me inventé yo, que son tres modelos ¿no? respecto de la religión. Están los agnósticos, los ateos y los creyentes respecto del traductor. El ateo 
es el que dice nunca voy a poder leer a Dostoyevsky si no hablo, escribo, ruso. Sí. Yeah, so she's got three models regarding religion in this sense. The atheist who says, I can't read Dostoyevsky unless I have Russian, learn Russian, approach it in Russian. Entonces Dostoyevsky, obviamente, en, en español no es Dostoyevsky. Dostoyevsky in Spanish is clearly eh, not Dostoyevsky. Después, por supuesto, después están eh, el que duda, ¿no? Bueno, el agnóstico. Y entonces, quizás si leo a Shakespeare en rumano, no sé si es Shakespeare o no, pero puede que sí. So that was the atheist. Then there's the agnostic. Oh, yeah, Shakespeare in Romanian. It might be Shakespeare, might not be. I don't know. Pero puede que sí. Y bueno, obviamente que después están los creyentes, ¿no? Es decir, puedo leer a a a Chiver en en hebreo y es Chiver, ¿no? So then there are the believers with Chiver in Hebrew. It is. It's that. Y bueno, yo creo que es muy interesante esta porque yo soy tengo en mí las tres cosas. Soy al mismo tiempo con los traductores, ¿no? Agnóstica, creyente y atea. Es decir, depende la página, depende el capítulo, depende la novela, de depende quién traduce y depende sobre todo, lo saben ustedes más que yo, de qué lengua a qué lengua, ¿no? So sometimes it's all three at once and we, 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 the translators are that as well. It depends on the page, it depends on the novel, it can even depend on the time, it can depend on the language pair itself. Claro, um, um, cuando leo Die My Love en inglés, eh, se da un efecto muy interesante para mí en la traducción que es que por momentos reconozco absolutamente mi escritura en español que ya no es un español puro ¿no? y por momentos es la escritura de otro el traductor so sometimes she reads down my love in English and she recognizes her writing in Spanish which isn't a pure Spanish but she recognizes it it's someone else's Claro, y, eh, pero yo siempre digo, quizás porque vivo en el extranjero, como muchos de ustedes que viven en otros países de los que, de los que nacieron, ¿no? que estábamos hablando recién con bastantes, eh, yo misma me considero una escritora traductora, aunque no traduzco nada, pero sí, escribir es traducir. ¿no? As a, a foreigner, like many of you here, you live in a country that isn't the country where you come from. Um, just, just as an aside, Ariana lives in, lives in France. Ah. So she counts herself as a writer, translator, even though she doesn't translate. She's a writer, translator. Sí, quizás no sé si hubiera sentido eso, si hubiera escrito en mi propio país. Quizás también, porque se puede ser un extranjero en tu propia aldea, en tu propio país. La extranjería no, no tiene que ver con que ahora estemos en Londres o en Bangladesh. Pero escribir ya es un acto de, de traducción permanente, ¿no? Y entonces... Cuando me traduce Ani y Carolina, por ejemplo, que está traducido a muchos, ya traducen un libro que a su vez es traducido. Entonces, traducción por dos, ¿no? So, perhaps you wouldn't have felt that if she was in Argentina, but she might have. You might feel like a foreigner in your own village, in your own hamlet. Um, it might be that we were in London here, you could be in London, could be Bangladesh, it doesn't matter. Um, después me has visto un poco. <risa> Esto pasará. Iba apuntando. <risa> eh, bueno, que es un efecto de doble traducción, it's, como it's una traducción al double, infinito. Double translation, it's translation to the infinite. To the Porque mi es... excelente. Porque mi español, <risa> mi español ya es un español totalmente contaminado por el francés. Entonces, como la pareja ideal no existe, los que están casados acá lo saben, el traductor, el traductor ideal tampoco. ¿no? Since the perfect partner does not exist, I am interpreting here. Her eye is my eye. Since the perfect partner does not exist, and those of us here in relationship porque, know that, then the perfect translator does not exist. Y era, obviamente el escritor ideal tampoco, porque cuando Carolina y Ani, pero digo Carolina, empezó a traducir, me dije, genial, Carolina es, eh, nació en Argentina. Es argentina, mucho, aunque hace 20 años vive en Reino Unido. Entonces dije, en eh, Edimburgo, perdón. Entonces dije, eh, ¿ella quién más va a entender mi escritura que alguien que ya piensa en español? ¿no? So when Carolina and Annie, but initially Carolina, yes. started translating her work, she thought, fantastic. Who better is going to understand this? She is out of time. She's been living in the United Kingdom in Edinburgh for 20 years. Who better is going to understand it? Who can, who can do this better? Claro, ella lee la lengua como alguien nativo, ¿no? So she reads the language like an actor. Pero no habla francés. So she doesn't speak French. Uh -huh. Y entonces, digo, como un efecto humorístico en el sentido de que siempre hay algo incompleto en la traducción. So say it's a slightly flippant remark, but there's always something incomplete in translation. Y bueno, y lo último que quería decir es que estoy de acuerdo con esa frase que dice que es traducir es sacrificar. Escribir también es sacrificar. So, um, to, to finish with this, she agrees with the, the sentiment that 
translation is sacrificing something, but also that writing is sacrificing something. Pero no respondí a tu pregunta para nada. It's interesting. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't answer my question, but it's very interesting. And we're here to listen to you. What I ask isn't important. What you say is important. Um, I think this leads in well to ask you, Annie, because we're talking about translation and the process. Mm -hmm. We've got the, this difficult text. How, how do you approach it as a translator? And we'll talk first about this and then lead into the co-translation idea because that would be very interesting for a lot of people in the audience, I'm sure. Yeah, I feel like it's so much about the voice that the kind of initial process of working on Ariana's work was just kind of feeling our way into a voice that worked and a lot of that was kind of trial and error and a lot of it involved, I feel like often with translating the process involves going a lot further away from the original and then kind of getting brave enough to come back. So I think initially we were smoothing a lot more out and trying to over explain stuff and change the commas. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> um, and then <laughs> and then the more the sort of closer to the text we got and the more confident that we got that we found a voice that worked, the more we realized that we could actually get a lot closer to the original and explain a lot less and sort of that the voice would carry it after all, so I feel like it was a process. And that process happened a lot during Die My Love, and then by the time we kind of came to people minded where the voice is different but very similar, we kind of felt like we were back in, we talked a lot about just feeling like we were back in the same world that we'd been in so vividly when we were working on Die My Love. Like it felt like sort of a strange kind of mental state that, that was yeah. still there. I'm I was just looking for something, I think it's at the end of here, since you've mentioned Die My Love, mm -hmm. I mentioned that you're the editor that translates mm -hmm. to Sarah Moses and uh, Carolina. Um, there's a line at the end which I found amazing when I got to the end of the book. The poetry, beauty and brutality of this book would not have come across fully in its English rendition without the meticulous help of our gifted editor, Annie McDermott. The translators of this book in Charcoal Press are immensely grateful. So could you talk a little bit about the editing process. Again, sometimes people think the translator has the last word in things, but editors, there are, there are different levels of editing. So could you talk a little bit about that and the teamwork with it, working with the translators? Yeah, I think it definitely felt like a team effort, Die My Love. It felt like, like I was saying, since we were sort of feeling ourselves, feeling our way into this very new voice, I think there was a lot of conversation about how we were going to do that, and it ended up feeling like a quite hands on edit in that way um, and quite a collaborative effort. I think partly because there were so many different, there were all of these different kind of Englishes and understandings of the text, so Carolina could bring that kind of, you know, yeah, she lived in Argentina and also I think left Argentina at a similar time to you, so you have a sort of version of Argentinian Spanish which is sort of frozen at the same point and you have sort of the same slang that stops when you leave Argentina and so you have like very very particularly similar Spanish and so that led to a lot of conversations that was just a kind of massive luxury we could sort of talk about exactly what things meant but then the sort of next stage was talking about exactly how they work in English so yeah it was a it was a team effort in that sense and I'm very maybe interfering editor, I don't know, maybe I'll have to. But, yeah, it you works. Do you want to say any more about that? Or yeah. do you want to move on to the next question? We can move on to the next question with that. Do you have to do that Do you like to say something? It's possible. Sí. No, bueno, y antes, <coughs> yo eh, pertenezco a la raza, no se habla de raza, pero de escritores totalmente insoportables con los traductores, porque muchos de mis contemporáneos no les importa para nada la traducción alemana, checa, italiana o, o, pol o polaca. Y en cambio yo me involucro muchísimo en todas las traducciones. So she is from that race of writers that is completely utterly unbearable for translators. There are some writers, it doesn't matter, there was a list of languages where the translations could go to, could be whatever language, they don't care. No, she gets involved with the translation process and with the translators. Y eso habla de una política de autor, porque acá ustedes van a ser quizás algunos traductores, bueno, ser traductor es ser escritor para mí. Eh, eh, eso habla de una política de autor, ¿no? Cuando se habla de qué política tenés, aparte de sacarse fotos en Instagram, esto es una política de autor, que es qué relación estableces con los traductores. Y ahí el problema está que a veces el traductor quiere que te metas y a veces no, ¿no? Y ahí es el problema. 
So you, you have an authorial, authorial, <coughs> translatorial policy. You, you, whatever that policy is, you might have then a translator who wants the author to do something. You might have a translator who wants the author to get involved. But you might have a translator that doesn't. Sí, en el caso de una lengua que uno habla perfectamente como, o, o muy bien como me pasa con el francés, fue una riña de gallo, no sé cómo decir, nos matamos, ahora sale la traducción al francés, fue un ejercicio, una batalla cuerpo a cuerpo, pero en el caso de lenguas que no hablo, como el alemán o el polaco, yo creo que igual el autor puede participar, aunque más no sea respondiendo algunas preguntas, ¿no? So in the case of a language that one knows perfectly or one knows very well, so in Ariana's case of French, it can be a real battle, a struggle, a hand-to-hand -hand battle, she said, over certain sentences. Without that knowledge, it might be it's a case of asking certain questions from the translator. And y uno de mis grandes miedos cuando, cuando me traducen es no tanto que la palabra no corresponda literalmente o el efecto estético, rítmico, sonoro, no se ajuste esos tecnicismos de la traducción. Lo que más miedo me da es que se cambie el signo político del libro, que se edulcore, que se aburguese, que ha pasado. So, ¿Cómo es un signo político? Que, que, que... Claro, no me da tanto miedo el efecto, sí, de, sino, de, 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 por ejemplo, que me ha pasado con la versión alemana u otra, que algunas cosas se edulconen, se vale. vuelvan políticamente correctas, vale. o se vuelvan eh, l'air du temps, a la moda. Mm. So the fear is not certain technical effects that the translator might have, a certain sound, a certain image, but rather that the translator might change something. So she talked about in German that it might get slightly sweetened, softened, made more politically correct. That is her fear in translation. Sí, yo lo llamaría censura lexical, porque estamos todos tentados de censurarnos lexicalmente. Está siempre la censura ahí por miedo, por pudor, y el escritor tiene que ir contra esa censura y para mí él. El traductor tiene el mismo challenge. Because it's a lexical, a form of lexical censorship. We have censorship everywhere in our lives, but the writer, writers, need to fight against this censorship. Y el traductor igual. Well. And, and the translator too. So this leads nicely into a question again about the translator, mm -hmm. censorship, the, the themes that we have here, we have Set. By the time we get to the fourth book, we have the Ophelia in there. These are, I've got my Spanish head on, so I'm thinking, mm -hmm. where well, this? These uh -huh. are, yes. these are difficult things, <laughs> issues to grapple yeah. with. We've also got a lot of swearing, we've got a lot of sex in there. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you feel as a translator? It feel emotionally, ethically? with it while you're doing it. Is there some kind of struggle as a translator to get the raw quality, the, the intense quality of the text through? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question, especially this sort of idea of kind of softening or sort of sweetening or smoothing out the ideas and the language and the bits, because it's so tempting to do that, because some of it's just horrible, like it's, um, like, <laughs> and I think, um, <laughs> anyway, um, and we had a lot of conversations about whether we could use a lot of words that come up in the book, and I imagine we're going to have a lot more conversations when we get on to De Generado, because that's got some more strong themes, um, and I sort of, And I guess some of it fits into stuff that has been talked about a lot during this conference, which is kind of the box that you want female writers to fit into. And if you want to say, oh, this is a very like, like even just wanting to say that a book is a very feminist book, that's a very kind of, you already want it to like obey certain things or not disobey other things. And so there's a kind of temptation to emphasize some things and not emphasize others, which it felt very important to resist. And I guess also maybe something with the the kind of new visible or newish or like you know changing developing visibility of the translator and the kind of idea that the translator will advocate for the book and speak about the book, speak about the book in the language that it's been translated in. And I guess sometimes that can make you feel that you're expected to identify or like you can feel a pressure to identify or not with the book that you're translating, which I think is probably not helpful and can lead to more pressure to change it than there would be if the translator was still invisible, which is maybe an interesting thing about visibility and not of the translator. So I think it was really 
Carolina and I gave each other a lot of pep talks about how, no, like, this isn't us, this is Ariana, but we've got to kind of stay true to it, and I hope that we did. But, yes, it was a struggle. <laughs> So we, we're getting translation both ways. <laughs> it's bilingual for everyone. Um, I, I realise that time is moving on. I wish that we could stay here all night, but we do need to move on. We will do the second reading, but I just want to make a slight point with that because we've talked about the, the content of the book. And I just want to praise Charco. As with many other small independent publishers that we've talked about under the stories, it's Corraldo, Pyrene, we could name many of them, so I'm not trying to dismiss their work, but the willingness to take risk on works like this. Mm. This is not something that your large conglomerate publisher would happily publish it. What do you compare it to? How do you try to frame this in some way when you're getting it to a readership? Yet what has happened in our industry in the past roughly 10 years is fantastic for this sort of work to be able to come out. Get off my little. <laughs> um, we have a second reading, mm -hmm. and so this one, page <coughs> maybe, uh, seventeen in, uh, in translation. Venga. <laughs> Después, si no desvarío, dijo que no podrá seguir viniendo tan seguido. Algo quería decir y no podía, aunque lo dijo claramente al pasar bajo el puente. Y el eco lo devolvió, que su situación, que el contexto, que ser responsable, que nos veremos, que no hay manera de no verse, que no estoy en su cerebro para entender, que entre un segundo a su cerebro pero que no podrá manejar hasta acá tan seguido, que pone en peligro todo, que me escribirá para la próxima cita. Lo escuché con la reverencia y el sobrecogimiento de una débil mental que se nubla y se pierde mil detalles a su alrededor una plaga de microbios sobre la esplanada. Confundo el meneo de los animales con el de las plantas, las lagartijas insoladas metiéndose en los canales de desagüe. Y todo el terminal, el terminal, terminal fue difuso, impreciso, brumoso. ¿Qué me había explicado? Seguíamos ligados, mi boca hecha un estirado hocico. ¿De dónde venían esos vocablos? ¿Por qué había preferido esos y no otros? ¿Qué idioma elegir para bautizar las cosas? ¿Cómo alguien es capaz de hablar? ¿Qué había dicho? Lo había olvidado. Era el líquido espeso de su saliva, juntándose, desarmándose en su paladar, esa transición de boca en divinidad. Como una condición genética sin cura, terminó su discurso y nos besamos. Y besarnos fue avanzar faca en alto. Afterwards, if I'm not delirious, he said he had to stop coming so often. He wanted to say something, but he couldn't, though he said it clearly enough when we went under the bridge and the echo sent it back. Something about his situation, the context, being responsible, that we'll still see each other, that it would be crazy not to, that I'm not in his brain so I can't understand, that I should try being in his brain just for a second, that he won't be able to drive all the way here so often that he's risking everything, but he'll text me about when we can next meet. I listened with the reverential astonishment of a feeble-minded woman getting things muddled, lost in the countless details that engulf her, a plague of microbes on the esplanade. I mistake the swishing of the animals for the plants, sunburnt lizards scuttling into the drain pipes. By the end, everything was vague, inexact, blurred. What had he just told me? We were still yoked together my mouth an elongated snout. Where were those words coming from? Why had he chosen them and not others? What language should we use when we name things? How does anyone manage to speak at all? What had he said, I'd forgotten already. It was the thick liquid of his saliva collecting and separating in his mouth. That transition of a mouth into divinity. Like an incurable genetic condition, he finished his speech and we kissed. And kissing was a steady advance, knife raised high. No, bueno, me parece muy interesante el fragmento que eligió Annie porque justo en el fragmento se pone la, en puesta en abismo, le hablo a los que sé que hablan español, se pone en abismo, así me siento menos sola, se pone en abismo esto que veníamos diciendo antes de qué es escribir, 
porque en el mismo texto literalmente pregunto ¿qué es escribir? ¿cómo se puede elegir una palabra y no otra? ¿Qué, ¿cómo puede alguien hablar? si en el mismo texto se pregunta y para mí escribir es eso es ¿qué es escribir? So she's very interested in the um, section that Annie chose Annie picked with two sections for tonight because it is a representation a definition of what it is to write what is it to choose this word and not that word um, es eso pone en abismo eh, esa pregunta que también la tiene que hacer el traductor ¿qué palabra elijo? So it's the question that the translator constantly has to ask, has to ask his or herself, what do you do, what do you choose, what word is it that you choose? Sí, do, tres cosas más y dijo, la, la primera es que todo el tiempo, aunque escriba un libro, dos, cuatro, cinco, todo el tiempo para mí, esta duda, que para mí debería ser la duda del rigor de todo traductor es, ¿qué palabra, qué palabra es la más adecuada? Y esta pregunta casi de vida o muerte, Debería ser un ejercicio, es el mismo ejercicio intelectual del traductor, ¿no? Finalmente. So, first thing about this, um, the... ¿Qué? ¿Qué has dicho al principio de...? de, de, de... La... ¿Cómo se elige la palabra? ¿Cómo se elige? Sí, sí but, uh, so the, 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 the mental exercise that the writer, that the translator should do, which word to choose, why this word, what word is it, it's exactly the same for the translator or the writer. Claro, y una vez conocí en Frankfurt, en, en la feria, hace mucho mi primer Frankfurt, primer mercado, conocí una traductora alemana, primera vez en mi vida eh, que conocí una traductora, a ver cómo era, ¿no? Me di cuenta, uno, que están total más locos que los escritores. <laughs> so a while ago, in the first Frankfurt, She met a German translator who's even crazier than writers. Eh, y después me di cuenta que, que somos iguales. Ella me contaba que para cuando no podía resolver algo del texto, porque es un, finalmente es como algo matemático, cuando no podía resolver algo, un giro, un efecto estético o poético, se iba a caminar por donde vivía en Alemania y hasta que no encontraba la solución no volvía. Y así es como escribo yo, ¿no? And so the translator, she couldn't resolve something because it's like a mathematical problem with some sort of turn, some sort of change. She'd just go out and walk around and around wherever she lived in Germany and would not come back until she told it. And that's exactly how she writes. Sí. Y después me parece muy importante, como por lo menos como yo como escritora, es eh, defender algunas palabras. Por ejemplo, en la traducción al francés, en el texto de Die My Love, Crève Mon Amour, Dice deportado, me van a deportar. Lo dice ella, que es una extranjera en Matate Amor, eh, y lo dice como un exabrupto, como una exageración. Y la traductora al francés quiso lavar, con eso digo edulcorar, y no poner deportar, sino expulsar, porque deportar remite a lo que ya sabemos, ¿no? Al holocausto. And so in French, well, in Spanish, there is, uh, uh, die my love, there is, at one point, the character says they're going to deport me. And in the French translation, the French translator didn't want to use the word deport, wanted to sugarcoat it and use expel because of the connotations of that word deport. Exacto, porque me dijo eh, deportar es, connota mucho en Francia la Shoah y va a confundir. Y yo defendí a muerte el deportar porque es a propósito. Yo quería esa connotación política en esa palabra que para los argentinos también tiene eso. Mm. So she defended the word deport to the last because it was chosen on purpose. It has those political connotations in, um, just to expand a little bit, in the Spanish language and in Argentine culture. And as an Argentinian, she knows what this word means. It has happened as well. Okay. Bueno, y respecto de la puntuación que ahora Annie puede decir algo, también fue un problema terrible. Obviamente tiene la misma importancia una palabra, una coma o tres puntos. La puntuación sabemos que es el pentagrama, ¿no? Es la sonata, la, la música. Pero ¿cómo hacemos? Porque Carolina me decía, en inglés necesito el punto. En español quizás no. En inglés necesito la coma. O viceversa. Y ahí tenemos un problema de cómo hacemos para negociar el ritmo. ¿no? So, punctuation. We're moving on to. Uh, but a word is as important as a coma, as a full stop, as an ellipsis. Uh, it, it's all part of the, the music of the text, and so then when Carolina would go to Ariana and say, I need a full stop. In Spanish you don't need a full stop, but here I need a full stop. What do you do? 
Por ejemplo, ella al final no había puesto la coma. Ya, de mm. Bueno, nos hemos peleado horas por una coma, ¿no? <risa> Last word in the book. Last word in the book of Die My Love, wild. Gets a comma just before it. Doesn't have that in Spanish. Pero bueno, yo quiero decir lo último, que a veces yo prefiero la incorrección gramatical, la, incorrec la no ortodoxia, ya hablamos de religión antes, la, la, el, más a, 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 los errores gramaticales, que nadie quiere igual, ¿no? A, a, a una tradición. So sometimes she'd prefer something to be grammatically incorrect mm. than to, she used the word traición, treason, to betray the original text. Prefieres. She prefers, she would prefer that incorrectness. As an editor, <laughs> how do you deal with that? I feel like editors get a bad press. I feel like not all editors want everything to be perfectly grammatically correct all the time. Um, I think... We did have a lot of discussions about commas. This is one of the things that when at the beginning I was sort of saying that we ended up going a lot further from the original and then coming back a lot closer. Some of it was with the punctuation um, and thinking, oh, maybe we can have some more commas. Um, <laughs> but I think also we kind of, the English does have a lot more full stops than commas, but I think it's not because it has a lot more complete sentences than fragments. It just breaks the sentences up in a way that works better for an English language reader than it does in Spanish, so I think we kind of found the compromise which wasn't smoothing out any of the grammar, but also having some full stops. Um, it's worth mentioning for those who don't know that whereas English word order is fairly fixed, in Spanish you can move things around, and the links can be markers of gender, number, and adjectives and so on that you don't have in English. Not that I'm trying to justify uh, <laughs> commas and so on, but you, you can see where these problems would arise. It's just gone eight, and there's... One thing I really want to ask, and I'll save for the questions after, but there is one question that I'd like to ask in the context of the past two days, and it's one for Ariana. In um, another critic's comments, Ari Kuntru, it says, We are used to female narrators who occupy one of several familiar niches. Harvick's takes us somewhere more profound and forces us to confront the thought that these easy fictional explanations are specious. Lurking inside all of us is the potential for horror. The first three books have female narrators. The fourth book, The Generado, has a male narrator and a male protagonist. So whereas we've, we've talked about the issue of women's writing in the past few days and, and where the writing from women authors, how it gets framed and sold, what could you tell us a bit about the critical reception for The Generado? Did anybody note and talk about the fact that you are a woman author writing with a male narrator and pr protagonist. Did anybody see it as problematic? Was it accepted perfectly well? Ah, okay. Sí. Bueno, primero lo que le decía antes, ¿no? Que este es un translating woman. Estamos hablando de edición, traducción, escritura en el mercado por las mujeres, que siempre hemos sido minorías, pero lo que me da pena es que casi todas acá somos mujeres, ¿no? Bueno, hay algún, pero so, um, something that she was mentioning before. Yes, of course. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Somos una selección. She was saying before that uh, it, it, translating women were talking about writing, translating, publishing, and women involved in this, and that it should include everybody in that, but you, you look in the room and it's mostly women. No, me pregunto, es todo muy... Estamos pensando una época en medio de una revolución. Lo que yo explicaba que a veces, ahora voy a degenerar. Me preguntan, ¿qué pensás de la lucha mujeres-hombres en la literatura feminista? Tu literatura es feminista. Y yo trato siempre de pensar críticamente, pero es difícil para nosotros pensar porque estamos en medio de una revolución. ¿no? Entonces es pensar mientras sucede. Pero creo que sería más interesante si pensáramos juntos hombres y mujeres. A veces veo que en las librerías los libros de las mujeres están por un lado, los de los hombres por otro. Entiendo esta división, eso lo hacen los religiosos. So at a point in time in the revolution, she's always trying to, to think politically about what she's doing, but this is in the revolution, she's thinking about it as it is taking place. Why should we have some sort of division? You don't want to walk into a bookshop and have women's books on one side and men's books on the other, or a, a little bit of kind of explanation with it. If you've got women's writing on one side and writing, as we found out yesterday, that 
the rest of it on the other side. Why? Why do we have this division? No, es algo que yo pensé que era un fenómeno de Buenos Aires en Argentina para nada, porque lo vi en muchas librerías en España, en diferentes ciudades, ¿no? En Perú, en México, en Ecuador, y empecé a ver que se reproducía en Europa y en América Latina, no sé, en Asia, en África. Y digo, bueno, es algo, por lo menos en Occidente, que se reproduce la lógica del mercado de el boom de las mujeres, los libros, pero a mí me cuesta sentirme cómoda, cómoda con esa nomenclatura, literatura feminista, porque siento que es algo que me está, a lo que me está empujando el mercado, no, no mi propia escritura. ¿no? So she's seen it in Europe, in Latin America, in Buenos Aires, different places that she's gone. She's not sure if this is the same everywhere. But there's a, there's a market logic that is enforcing this idea. And she feels as though she's being propelled by this market logic towards some sort of idea of books authored by women. Sí, más para vender que por una real eh, empatía estética. Porque yo a veces quizás escribo más parecido a un hombre que a una mujer, no necesariamente escribo parecido a una contemporánea mía porque es mujer y tiene 40 años. It's to sell books, it's nothing to do with aesthetics, it's not that the book is similar to a book written by a contemporary female author of the same sort of age, it's just to sell books. Y después de haber escrito entonces tres libros, tres short eh, novel, eh, novel, Die My Love, Feeble Mind y Precocious, eh, sentí, yo no las escribí, yo las escribí, sobre todo Matata y la del mental, antes de Ni Una Menos, antes de la Afer. Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein, mm. antes de, antes de, fue en 2012, entonces, oh, me too, antes, mucho antes, eh, era otro contexto, aunque eran solo 6, 7 años de diferencia, pero me pareció interesante con Degenerado plantear una novela escrita en un, en un personaje hombre que encima es un criminal sexual, es decir, las antípodas de lo que está, o sea, justamente ponerme en el centro de lo que está, era y esta época condena, ¿no? So she wrote the first three books, Die My Love, Feeble-Minded, Precoce, Precocious, before everything to do with Harvey Weinstein and Me Too and so on. Even though we're only talking a period of six or seven years, it's before that, it was a different time. So with the general, it is after that time. So she's written with a protagonist, a narrator, who has committed a sexual crime. Igual pensé que me iban a, las críticas iban a ser malas, y pensé que como se lee hoy en día desde la ética, desde la ideología, pensé que iban a condenar el libro, pero parece que es a fe, ¿no? Bueno, ahora por ahora se está traduciendo al rumano y al árabe en Irak, lo cual me parece muy interesante porque es casi la apología del crimen sexual, es decir, otra vez, todo lo que esta época condena. Entonces, yo lo hice casi como una provocación intelectual para mí misma, porque escribir es ponerse en riesgo, entonces siempre voy a tratar de escribir lo que sea más difícil para mí. So, it's been translated into Romanian and Arabic if in Iraq, which she finds very interesting, because the book is, a, is an apology for the sexual crime itself. And she wrote it as... Es como un, para ir a, a lo, como un desafío en todo sentido, ¿no? Ir a lo, porque siempre se me identificaba con mis personajes femeninos por la maternidad, mm. pero ahora no me van a identificar con un pedófilo, ¿no? So she's always identified in some way with her previous narrators, but she's not going to identify in any, any way with a pedophile. That's a way to end. <laughs> <laughs> we talking. We we just passed. Well, we about ten past. Helen, you were just past. No, it wasn't no. Nice. So I think let's bring this part of the session to an end. I think a big round of applause. Right. <laughs> Thank you.